everybody here, I'm also quite passionate about marketplaces. And the earlier and the messier, the better. Uh, and what fascinates me specifically is this idea that no two stages are the same. Uh, and as the marketplace business evolves, there's a lot of uh, difference and a lot of uh, evolution in how operators and founders should think about different stages. Uh, so as Paula said, I've had the pleasure and uh, the opportunity uh, to either work on or uh, invest in or, or advise a lot of marketplaces across different uh, stages in different sectors. Um, so I'll try to give some, uh, uh, some principles that I found to be uh, insightful uh, and translatable across, across sectors. Now I'm going to start with a, with a legal disclaimer. I don't know if you read my background, but I used to be a lawyer early in my career, so I cannot, I cannot help it. Number one is that there's a lot of cliches uh, that I will assume are already known, things like, uh, in the beginning, do things that do not scale or uh, be customer obsessed. That's, of course, quite fundamental, uh, but it's also quite known, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avoid uh, um, uh, these points. Um, be caution around being mindful of generalizations. Uh, literally, I've seen hundreds of ways to get a specific outcome. Um, there is few things that work across the board. Um, so we should be very uh, mindful of specific things that work for specific startups, specific sectors, not across the board. Uh, and also, I'm going to be quite quick to allow a lot of time for uh, what you actually want to talk about, so do you have any questions? Now, if we take a bit of a, of, of, of a high level, a bit of simplistic view, uh, you can think of three phases in early uh, marketplaces, right? You have the launch phase, which is about getting the ball rolling, uh, actually creating transactions on the platform, um, and creating liquidity, initial liquidity on both sides, or three sides if it's a, if a, th if it's a three sided marketplace. Uh, after that, you get into the scaling phase, where it's about standardization of the user flows, um, and also growing top line and, and bottom line. And finally, when you get into the, the expansion phase, uh, the game is around expanding, but also choosing where to expand. You can expand geographically, you can expand horizontally, you can expand vertically. Now, let's talk a bit about uh, some concepts which I found quite insightful um, in the launch phase. I'm going to start with something quite fundamental, in my opinion, um, which is the willingness, I would call it, to transact based on the status quo, right? Um, a lot of successful marketplaces in the beginning, they literally allow for transactions to be completely off-platform, literally uh, accepting and fulfilling uh, orders by email, by phone calls, by whatever, even physical arrangements. Um, I don't think that's a problem. In the early phase, I think uh, you can be deliberate about letting transactions happen off-platform, and then once the marketplace actors realize the value, they cross that trust barrier, uh, they start seeing their revenue opportunity, there's a natural tendency for them on their own to move onto the platform. And the other interesting point here, I think, is the, the minimization of, of the switching costs or the onboarding costs uh, for actors coming to the platform. Uh, and I'll give an example to highlight what I mean. I'll, I'll use my, my current company, Kogira. So in the first like six to nine months, what we did is that on the seller side, which is usually the hardest part in marketplaces, we allowed the sellers to transact with us in any way they were used to transacting before with other parties. Do you, wanna, do you want us to place an order on you by email? No problem. Uh, do you want to do it via API? No problem. Um, using our seller portal. Uh, so that created a lot of initial liquidity. It was a very quick and effective solution to chicken and egg. And of course, once you scale, you can start kind of merging everybody and, and creating one universal flow. Uh, but I think that's a very key point in creating early liquidity in, uh, in marketplaces. Thank you. Um, now, the, so how do you convince um, sellers uh, to get onto the platform? And I'm going to talk a bit more about sellers because, again, it's usually the hardest part in, both, in, both, in, in most marketplaces. I think an underappreciated strategy is, is literally to financially motivate the seller side, literally to pay for supply. Uh, and I think this is something that Uber has done well in the past. Um, 
Here's an example of, of driver guarantees, which is what? So when Uber launches a new market, a typical strategy is that you say, hey, driver X, if you are uh, X amount of time on the platform and take X amount of trips, uh, we're going to guarantee you X amount of earnings. Um, what I find quite interesting about this tactic is that it's, even though it, it's about spending money, it's actually way more cost effective than people think. Um, and why is that? I mean, obviously, mathematically, right? You pay only the delta between realized earnings and, and promised earnings, so just that small part. Um, if you compare the customer acquisition cost this creates versus other channels, it is often quite uh, appealing. Uh, and almost always, stuff like that has a big virality effect. So you also have free additional supply acquisition, uh, which you don't pay for. So all in all, I think that's a quite effective uh, tactic. Uh, that I, don't, I don't see enough marketplace uh, um, founders employing uh, smartly. Now, the other uh, cl classic debate here is, is that between um, technology and operations in the launch phase, right? Questions like, oh, should I hire a lot of engineers? Should I productize? Should I build technology? Or should I kind of patch the holes by, through labor and hire operations people and, and literally do the work manually? Um, my personal view on this one is that for this phase, what makes more sense is, uh, is not being afraid to just throw labor hours into a problem. Uh, operations at this stage are fine, so long as you can materialize your value proposition. Uh, you don't need to be overly fixated on, on productization and technology. Uh, and obviously, once you scale, each unit of labor, uh, one at a time, gradually is being replaced uh, by code, right? What, though, I think is very crucial, and I've seen it uh, being quite messy, is the type of operators you're going to bring into the team, right? Um, so in, in high growth uh, marketplaces, um, the role of the operations team literally changes every, every week, right? Or every month. Every time you ship something, some part of that scope and some part of that labor is being replaced by technology. Uh, so what I think is super crucial here um, is, is to hire people who are adaptable, agile, uh, flexible, and they're comfortable with that constant reinvention uh, of, of the role of, uh, of operations. Uh, if I look at Kogira now, uh, the operations team, 90% of the work they did uh, 10 months ago uh, is not the same. OK, so um, uh, Marketplace has been launched. Um, I, again, to, to reiterate, I think the crucial points are transacting uh, based on the status quo, uh, being willing to, to pay for, for supply, um, and be deliberate about doing operations work versus tech work, but hiring the right profiles. Uh, now, what happens in the scaling phase, right? When, we, when the game becomes uh, a game around standardizing the user flows, right? Killing that initial forking that we talked about, and also growing uh, top line and, and hopefully also, also bottom line. Now, when I start with something uh, quite fundamental, um, if you think about the classic, most foundational marketplace thinking, it's about trade-offs, right? It's, it's usually portrayed as a zero-sum game between the different sides of the marketplace. Uh, and the classic ju ju juxtaposition, excuse me, is the one between um, um, buyer benefit and seller benefit. And usually that's about, do I have a lower price for buyers or do I maximize the earnings of my, of my seller side? Uh, so it's all a trade-off, it's all a zero-sum game. What I've seen is that if you're smart, to, to, to be honest, this does not have to be a zero-sum uh, game dynamic. And let me use again an example from, from Uber. So how does Uber think about um, rider and, and driver welfare uh, benefit, right? So the hero KPI on the rider side is conversion rate. What percentage of riders looking for a trip actually complete a trip? And that encapsulates availability, waiting time, price, quality, everything. Um, the corresponding KPI on the, on the supply side, the driver, is earnings per hour. Right? That's a fundamental objective of a, of a driver on the platform. Many local marketplaces of Uber, many markets, uh, and increasingly so, are able to be in that top right quadrant, which is good rider experience, 
quality ETA um, price point, at the same time having strong driver earnings. Um, and how does that happen? Through utilization, right? And think about it. So you keep your rider price point constant. Uh, you obviously command a big service fee, around 25% from the drivers. But because utilization is quite high, trips per hour are high, the absolute number, uh, the financial return per hour on the platform from the supply side, in this case the drivers, is quite high. Um, now, how does high utilization emerge, right? Um, in ride sharing, it's mostly smart um, um, uh, matching between demand and supply. Um, algorithmic driver incentives, and also doing dynamic pricing to keep demand uh, constant. Uh, but the question for your marketplaces is, what are these forces that can get you out of this, let's call it pseudo trade-off uh, dynamic and be able to, to, to optimize both uh, sides at the same time? OK, another classic debate. Uh, pretty much for, for, for every company really, is the one between growth and profitability, right? Should I grow more? Should I capture a take rate? How much? Of course, your investors want both, right? They're going to tell you, hey, I'd love to see 30% month-over-month growth and a 10% uh, take rate. Except Speed Invest who understands the, the patience and the, <laughs> the trade-offs, <laughs> especially Paola individually. <laughs> right, so um, my view here since we're talking about uh, scaling phase, not, not mature state, is that you, you need to validate the ability to command the take rate, uh, but leave that money on the, on the table, right? Um, and what does that mean? If you can create a delta, a price delta between, crudely speaking, how much you buy for, whatever it, that means in your marketplace, and how much you sell for, you prove that there is a delta, so by adding that markup, you still have demand, retention, all the KPIs you're going to see on the demand side, uh, but you choose to either translate into uh, um, demand side benefits, so lower price, or supply side benefits, so higher earnings on the platform. But it needs to be a validated uh, point. What happens otherwise, and you've seen that in a lot of marketplaces, especially lately this year, right? Uh, is you grow, you grow, you grow top line, one round after the other, and at some point, people realize, oh, this platform cannot extract the margin, what about revenue? And this creates, obviously, massive issues in terms of team morale, valuation, uh, rounds, uh, the whole business model of the, of the company. Uh, and now, the, the last uh, kind of big debate I've seen in this phase is the one around the, the marketing capability. Um, so, do you build it in-house, do you outsource it, and how quickly do you do that? Uh, and what I've typically seen is founders taking one of two avenues, right? One is the kind of very primitive in-house, let's say, like literally founders calling uh, suppliers and calling buyers, especially in low volume, high uh, item value marketplaces. Or, hey, I'm going to outsource it, I'm going to get a digital agency, they're going to do some Google Ads for me, I'm going to pay them. Um, in my opinion, um, the marketing machine in marketplaces needs to be in-house and needs to uh, start being built quite early. Um, and, and the reason is, number one, it's, marketing is very closely uh, linked with customer discovery. So you need a very tight loop between product and marketing. Um, it's actually not... Uh, uh, cheaper, I think, to, out to outsource it. Um, I think having it in-house also makes financial uh, benefit, even though it might sound uh, counterintuitive at this phase. Um, and also, it's a capability that it needs a lot of time to, to develop, especially in the modern growth hacking, kind of mathematical algorithmic marketing. You need months, if not uh, one, two years, to develop the capability that you know you're going to need down the line. So I'm a big proponent of creating that early, before the mature phase while you're still scaling and while you really do not need the, the volumes yet. Okay, perfect. So, so you've launched, you've scaled uh, by, by tech startup standards. This is kind of a, a mature, uh, steady business. And then the next big phase is the one of expansion, right? And as I mentioned here, th there is kind of three dimensions in which a marketplace can expand. Uh, one is horizontal add more products right, um, or services. 
Uh, the other is vertical, control more of the, of the supply chain, and the other is geographic. I'm going to launch more cities, more markets. Um, uh, Uber, again, is a, is a classic example. Now, um, wh which one makes more sense, how I think uh, operators should think about them? I don't really have an insight which can apply um, universally. Um, I mean, you, you see different companies doing different things, right? Amazon, for example, vertical integration uh, going down the supply chain. Uber, a classic example of very quick global expansion. Again, Amazon, horizontal expansion uh, in the beginning. But what I, what I can tell is that doing more than one at the same time does not work, right? Um, let's again take Amazon as an example. It was done in sequence, right? First, horizontal expansion. I'm going to start with books, and then I'm going to do, I don't know, adjacent products. Um, separate phase was the vertical integration, uh, controlling the logistics, the shipping capability, uh, working with warehouses, even buying, holding inventory, buying from vendors directly uh, versus just being a platform. Um, and then um, the separate stage was the geographic expansion. Um, actually, even now, if you think about it, a lot of mid-markets, Amazon is not present in locally. Like my home country, Greece, there is no Amazon. We buy from, from the UK. So I think the key here is to be mindful of the, of the sequentiality versus that uh, intense temptation of, oh, if I, if I launch this additional service, I can get 2% more take rate. And let's launch uh, France. It's a quick win or low-hanging fruit, a, cl a classic phrase which I think can drive you to, to many mistakes. Uh, so sequential versus parallel um, expansion. Now, let's talk a bit about um, specifically geographic expansion, uh, especially when you're expanding in uh, many markets. The same way that a marketplace should be scalable, so should also be its expansion strategy. Uh, and what that means is being able to expand quickly with minimal incremental effort uh, and cost effectively. So to use again the Uber example, in its uh, international expansion, that would be between 2014 and 2016, the company used what, what I would call playbook expansion, which I'm, I'm a big fan of. So literally like a pilot's checklist. What do I, I need to take these 50 steps to launch in a new city. You execute it. Then second city, you execute the same thing. You realize, oh, something is off, or I need to add these two things, or I'm going to refine it. So that playbook keeps, keeps getting refined, enriched, uh, and optimized. Uh, but it does become, at some point, a repetitive uh, um, tested process. And that's, I think, one of the big reasons why Uber was able to, to expand quite quickly. And of course, there's also side benefits right around um, uh, positive regulatory influence or uh, local competition, etc. So speed is very important in many marketplaces, especially global ones. And playbooking your expansion is, is in my opinion, the biggest driver to create uh, that speed. Now, um, what I've seen a lot in, uh, in that idea of geographic expansion uh, is this perception of local teams and local leaders that their market is somehow unique and unlike any other. Uh, and that, <laughs> that includes myself, actually. When I was uh, running Uber in Greece, I did think that, oh, you don't understand. Like, Greece is a very specific market. It has this characteristic. That other characteristic, it's quite unique. Um, frankly, if you take a bit of a, of a more um, high-level view, what, what the simple thing that is happening, in my opinion, is that none of us, we do not have, we do not have a simultaneously good overview of a big enough number of markets as a local uh, leader, a local team, to realize the common patterns and, and, uh, uh, and similarities. Um, so by simply looking at your set of expansion areas, concluding what are the key characteristics, the key dimensions. In ride sharing, for example, you could say they are uh, the setup of supply. What is it like, the regulatory uh, environment? Uh, and the competitive dynamics, let's say. So with it, using these dimensions, you can create out of a set of, I don't know, 50 markets, 100 markets, a way smaller set of market archetypes, two, three, four market archetypes. And you'll find that really what does work in a market typically works in another market of the same archetype. Because the, the dimensions that matter are, are finite. So using them, you can craft 
uh, common groupings and again be way more efficient um, in your in your scaling. Um, of, of course, in some cases, indeed maybe UK big market for a European startup, of course, might be actually unique on something, right? Of course, you can uh, do an exception and tailor to that market, but your base case should be market archetyping and grouping, not. Uh, treating each market as a separate, unique, uh, odd beast that needs a completely, uh, from the ground up, tailored approach. So as I promised, I was uh, quite uh, uh, quick. Um, these are some concepts that I've seen work. Um, I w I w I'm not going to say across the board, but are, are found to be quite translatable across phases, across marketplaces, and across sectors. Um, again, I want to highlight that I think there's a lo way more variance, a way, way more exception than people realize when they try to create these guidelines and these, uh, these uh, uh, rules. Uh, so I want to leave you with, uh, with that thought. Uh, and I'm, I'm more than happy to, to talk about whatever is specifically interesting to, to you or your uh, businesses uh, and take any questions. Thank you. coming here. A uh, quick question. What are you looking uh, for uh, in a marketplace to understand if there is a real need for a marketplace or if you can really extract a take, a take rate? What's, what's the characteristics that you are looking for? Yeah. Um, I think the key factors are if there is enough fragmentation on the supply side, but that's not enough on its own because there, there are uh, spaces where there is, a, there is a very big number of actors they're all very small, but for some reason they have they, ha they have similar prices, right? So if you have the double combination of a fragmented uh, supply side with a lot of price variance, be that in terms of time, for some reason prices of X in the, uh, go up in, in February and then they fall in March, or there is geographic variance, or between actors, uh, supply actors in the same country, that variance uh, creates that delta. Uh, which uh, allows you to, at the same time, offer a good price to your buyer, but also it creates your margin, right? So that can give you a very uh, significant take rate um, because there is, a, there is a delta within the supply side. Um, and then additionally, how many pro for each problem you solve, you get an additional take rate extraction opportunity, right? Do you solve discovery only? SAS fee X percent. Do you create price competition using price variance? They create part of the delta becomes yours. Uh, then the classic adjacencies that marketplaces use, like shipping, like insurance, like data, that's all incremental uh, take rate opportunity. Hi, uh, so I'm looking at your website and right now it seems like there's one and a half million SKUs. So I'd like to hear about how did you go about fight like phases or target setting for your organization in terms of vertical, horizontal or global expansion? That's a great question. L let's test if we did what I'm advocating and we did it sequentially. Um, so we started with fragrances. The reason is that it's a, it's a high margin, uh, low volume. Um, reasonable price point item. Uh, so we build the system around that. Um, and geographically, we started in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, the first step we took is that we expanded beyond fragrances. Why did we choose the horizontal expansion first? Because there's pretty much nothing I can think of that changes in our model. If instead of fragrances we trade, if you look at the key categories, you'll see like pet, pet supplies or electronics or toys. There's nothing different in our business model if you do these products. The only things that we cannot do, uh, we would choose not to do because they would mean a big difference in, in, in how we operate, would be like, you know, very big size items, like, I don't know, furniture, uh, regulated goods, 
or like perishable goods, because you need to do very quick with shipping. Uh, so we realized that, hey, it's quite horizontally translatable. We're going to go from fragrances, I don't know, 50K SKUs to like a million and a half. Um, the second thing we did is geographic expansion. Uh, so now we're loving in 50 markets uh, across the EU, US, uh, UAE, etc. Um, and then the th thirdly, we went into vertical integration, which for us, we do not hold inventory uh, like Amazon does in some uh, cases on the B2C world, uh, but we have launched adjacencies. So now we command the take rate uh, thanks to shipping, uh, integrating the shipping, not uh, executing it, of course, uh, offering insurance. Uh, and offering uh, uh, financing. And the beautiful thing about uh, Jason's is that I could have mentioned is that typically there is zero marginal cost and it's all pure um, uh, revenue, right? Because usually the cost setup and the headcount is fixed, right? So 2% uh, insurance means 2% incremental uh, revenue. Uh, what is a bit confusing with Cogita is that we did these three phases very quickly like within uh, nine months, we had additional services and like a 500k SKUs and, and, and vertical integration. But they were distinct. So I think we, we didn't break my, <laughs> my rule. Thanks. Hey there. Uh, first of all, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, before I started my uh, journey into the startups and marketplaces, I've been researching a lot uh, about how multi-sided platforms, ecosystems, and uh, businesses are built. So I've been interviewing a bunch of companies, starting from the funding, you know, the to growth, scaling, maturity, uh, and further on. And uh, one of the patterns I've seen that uh, it's obvious for all the presence here uh, is that one of the driving factors, the most important one is the network ethics, right? Multi-sided network ethics, both sided, one sided, depending on the, uh, on the business model. Um, so my question here is, what is your pick on the critical mass or achieving critical mass within multi-sided platforms? <laughs> That's a great and complex question. Um, I, I, I cannot, I, I don't, I, there is no concrete answer. You, you go from the data to the conclusion, not the principle to, 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 to what to do. I'll give you an example. So at Cogita, we saw um, that when you get to 15 sellers per geo, uh, per category, that flywheel starts, right? Why? Because you can, you can imagine, right? And if you have a thousand sellers for one SKU, the thousand first margin is at zero value. I don't know why that number is around 15 for us. It was a data science exercise, but it was. Um, so, so it depends on the business and it depends on, the, uh, on what you're going to actually uh, see. The, in three sided marketplaces, I think what's specific is because simply you have three actors, not two, you have more opportunity to create um, um, referral systems uh, and, and, fin and incentivize sites to bring other sites, right? So if you take uh, food delivery, for example, um, you can go to a restaurant, <coughs> one supply side actor, and give them financial incentive or referral bonus or ask them to onboard their uh, um, uh, delivery staff onto the platform so you're solving also your second side um, of the marketplace. Um, so I think that that's crucial. Uh, and the, the last thing I'd like to say on this one is um, what I think is, the, is is a key factor is the locality or not of the network effects. Uh, for example, if we take food delivery or ride sharing, uh, let's take food delivery, which is a three-sided uh, marketplace, people were very enthusiastic initially about the network effects. If you see Uber presentations, or all the common presentations, like first slide network effects, flywheel, etc. Yes, but that's not global, right? Every market, if your marketplace has a local identity, right, the fact that Uber, ex Uber Eats exists in New York doesn't make it easier to win Mexico. Okay, maybe there's a percentage of travelers who you know, move from New York to Mexico, but, but that's it, right? So the network effects in, are limited to the, to the confines of the geographic identity of the, of the marketplace. So you need to rebuild them 
in each new uh, location. Uh, except when travel is your competence, like Airbnb, where the fact that Airbnb has, destina has more destinations other than uh, the one I'm based in is actually part of the value prop. So that does have global network effects. Sorry, I, didn't, I couldn't give you a very concrite, specific answer because no, it's, it's, it's a very tough it's question to uh, it's by definition. It's a very complicated question, so thank you. I have a question as well. So you said um, it's important to hire people in operations who are flexible, are agile, and they're comfortable with the level of constant reinvention of the role that the role takes. But so my question is, how do you vet that uh, in hiring, during the hiring process? Sure. Um, number one is through a lot of honesty uh, and being very transparent during the, the, the hiring process that what the role is about right now, what it might be in the future, and how quickly it, uh, it changes. Uh, for senior operators, I would always insist on, on discussing the one-year plan, uh, how do they see the, the, the next uh, uh, period in the company, exactly because of the, of the changeability. Um, number two is that, I mean, th there, is a, there is an element of, of the background informing that ability, right? If, if an operator has been in a high growth marketplace which went from, from C to Series B, let's say, by definition, probably, they've experienced that very thing you'd be, uh, you'd be looking for. And then the third component, besides any competence or, or the actual background, is the actual uh, culture. You, you know, there's candidates who are very honest uh, uh, during the discussions who do uh, prefer stability, um, uh, more uh, quiet, etc. There, there are others who love that uh, agility and that, that, uh, that um, uh, change. Uh, for me, it's, uh, <laughs> I use the term the right amount of chaos. If it's too much, it's overwhelming. If it's too little, it's boring. Uh, so I try to uh, work with people who enjoy that sweet spot, uh, which is also my personal uh, preference. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions? Yeah. Thank you for the presentation, Manolis. Uh, I assume Cogita now is a scaling phase. So what are the two, three mistakes that you did in the first phase that we are right now, for example, as a company, that we should uh, learn from and you know, avoid doing things like that? That's a great question. Um, We, we, we grew, because of our insane product market fit, uh, one of the things that we did is that we grew so much that some pillars of the organization could not afford that growth. For example, team size, uh, scalability of the, of the operations, uh, technology. Uh, so what we did is that we, we put a pause, actually. Literally, we stopped uh, any, anything demand side related. Nothing. And we said, OK, what do we need to do 20x? We need to hire this type of people. We need these capabilities, these teams, this technology, uh, and this type of operations. Uh, and we actually simply executed all of that uh, with always the, the first principle being, is what I'm doing now, uh, can this work with 100 times more volume, whatever anybody in the company does? If the answer is no, we need to fix something. Yeah, if the answer is yes, check. We're ready for a, uh, for a scaling phase. Um, the other thing which I'm a bit, um, I'm on the fence, I don't, re I don't have a firm view, is the remoteness versus hybrid versus in-person environments. Uh, I mean, Kogira specifically, we are uh, remote first, but also have offices in three locations, so whoever wants uh, spends time there also for uh, team building uh, effect. I don't know, obviously it, it's, uh, uh, there, there is positives and negatives. In my view, um, remote is, is a net positive. Um, uh, the, the benefits are obvious. The downside around culture building, coordination, organization, if you're very deliberate about it, very well organized, you really try to mimic the in-person environment virtually, it can work. 
uh, and even on a, on a marketplace which has a lot of, we have three warehouses, right? It doesn't get any more physical than that, right? So if, if a marketplace with physical operations can work well remotely, I think the default is that uh, um, th that works. Thank you. Sure. One question around uh, uh, verticals. Um, I think you mentioned that one of the routes is to go you know, deeper into the vertical. I think one of the, the problem, a lot of those vertical marketplaces, they solve a real problem, but the problem um, with many of those businesses is that they have a very low frequency of use, mm. which makes it very complex to build, or actually to scale. So what is your sort of perspective sure. on that? Yeah, I, I think the equation is not, frequency in itself is not a problem. The equation I think is, Average transaction size times frequency times take create potential. For example, uh, Airbnb. How often? I don't know. Me, me I, I book on Airbnb maybe once a year, but it's a bloody big transaction uh, value, right? Some B2B marketplaces, chemicals, for example. Uh, it's even like I've, I've seen some machinery equipment, right? Obviously, the higher the transaction value, the more you can afford uh, low frequency. Fre the, the problem is leakage, uh, when you do not offer enough ongoing value for the parties to keep transacting on the marketplace. Um, but frequency alone, uh, you, you can offset it and still be a very healthy, uh, high top line, high bottom line marketplace, if we're talking about the right uh, space with, with, the, with the right um, uh, transaction value. Thank you so much, Manolis. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been Thank amazing. You. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Thank you.